Welcome to the MedTalks podcast YouTube channel, where we will be discussing a range of topics with a focus on health and well-being. You'll be joined by myself, Mehran, and my friend Fahim, along with expert guests, to discuss things further. Please don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome, everybody. You're listening to another edition of Med Talks. Uh, you're listening to myself, uh, Mehran, and I'm also joined by my usual co host, Fahim Shakur. Uh, we have some great guests, but I just want to tell you a little bit more about ourselves. So, we are a group of doctors that uh, raise issues around health and well being. Um, we do have a, a YouTube channel. So, if you go onto YouTube and look for Med Talks podcast, so Med Talks with an X, uh, you'll find us there if you want to see us. We're also broadcasted live on Pendle Community Radio, uh, AWAS 103.1 FM. We'll try to do our uh, to do our best, but if it's any uh, questions about specific management about your care, please do uh, catch up with your GP or the specialist doctor involved. Fine. Over to you, Fahim. Excellent. Thank you, Mehran, for the uh, introduction. I'm pleased to say that we have uh, two guests in uh, Dr. Wesley Tensel and Dr. Said Mehdi. Dr. Wesley Tensel is a GP from Lee and also a club doctor for Rochdale AFC. And uh, wow. Dr. Said Mehdi is a consultant at Preston Hospital. And he is also uh, quite interested in gardening in terms of his hobbies. And we'll be talking about lung cancer and other things. So first, um, we're going to go to Wesley, I think. Hi, Wesley. Hi, thanks for having me on the show today, guys. Yeah, pleasure. Where's uh, tell us where where your your team is in the league, Wes? <laughs> I've not looked at the table recently since, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure you looked on my behalf. Um, I did. You just um, about relegation, Wes. <laughs> well, well, the season's hopefully finished now, so we'll start afresh next season. Uh, no, just joking aside, though. T tell me, Wes. Um, tell me about football a little bit and your role as a club doctor. Um, so yeah, I'm the um, club doctor at Rochdale Football Club, so that entails mainly GP-related things, to be honest, which is my day job. So I'm in con regular contact with the players uh, for any day-to-day -day issues, but on a match day, um, I'll sit on the bench pitch side, and if there's any major traumas or any incidents, then if the physio needs my assistance, and I'll go on the pitch and I'll help as well. Um, and I've been doing that for about 10 years now, I've been at Rochdale. Great, Wes. And obviously, you're working on a COVID ward as well in uh, Leeds. Yes. Um, obviously, since all this occurred, um, I offered my services to work just, just one day a week. So every Monday, um, there's been a specialist unit set up in Lee, which is my local hospital, uh, for COVID positive patients. Um, so we're just helping to take the burden off the local trust like Wigan and Wrightington and manage some of those patients. So... It's been nice to go back into uh, the hospital um, after many years out. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's just good to give back as well to help. Excellent. One, one of the main topics we want to start off with, Wesley, um, and we will try to get your thoughts on it as well, Saeed, uh, is that if we look at sleep, I've looked at your presentation, it's very informative, and it's, you know, I learned quite a bit uh, through it. Uh, you know, perfect example being that Usain Bolt I was asleep uh, until 35 minutes before he broke the world record. So, um, yes. so, so how, so how, what can you educate the, uh, what can you say about sleep in terms of educating? It's, it's, it's a massive it's a topic. topic. Um, uh, there's so much, so much that people don't realize, don't realize about the benefits, of, the sleep. benefits of sleep. So if, so if I was to say to you or to the public that we've discovered a revolutionary new treatment uh, where you could live longer, um, it enhances your memory, it makes you more creative, it makes you look more attractive, it keeps you slim, it lowers food cravings, it protects you against cancer, dementia, it lowers your risk of heart attacks, strokes, diabetes. You know, are you interested in this product? People would just laugh at me and say, oh, what are you talking about? There's no such thing. But all of those things, sleep actually does. Yeah. Um, and as a GP, obviously I'm seeing people with all sorts of issues. So anxiety, depression, um, dementia, and 
when I ask them, a lot of them, you know, how many hours a night do you sleep? They'll say, oh, I'm, I'm all right. I had about four, four, five hours a night. And really, we should be aiming uh, to be getting about eight hours. And that's the ideal figure um, that we, would, we should be aiming to get. Um, the reason being is that there's lots of evidence, lots of medical research has gone into this to say that people who consistently get, you know, even if it's six hours a night uh, instead of the eight, they do have problems um, down, down the line. Um, if I was quickly just to I'll just mention something in terms of diabetes, which is, is a massive topic, um, but they, they were experiments that have been done um, where they had a group of people who they allowed to, they took all, took the blood sugar measurements yeah. and they let the one group sleep for eight hours and the other group sleep for six hours. And they did that for a week. So they were sleep deprived only two hours, obviously less than the others. But when they then repeated the blood sugars, the people who had slept in the six hour group actually had the blood result of somebody who was pre-diabetic. So they were not diabetic, but it was, it was elevated. And you know, it's a category in general practice where it's a warning that people may become diabetic. So it's a massive, it's a massive thing. And it's free. You know, you don't need to, it's not a tablet you need to take. Um, but obviously some people do struggle with sleep. And that's also something that I have to try and help with. In the challenge that I have is it's, um, as you rightly said, you know, um, there are various duration periods aren't there and I think eight hours seems to be the most commonly prescribed yeah. duration but there's some variation with that but mm -hmm. to get that eight hours you need to be using the 16 hours effectively correct because um you know how how do you encourage people to ensure that um difficulties such as initial insomnia or rumination or other various things that could impact on their sleep mm -hmm. what kind of so yeah there are, there are obviously lots of um, different things that can impact on sleep. Um, and the, the phrase that we use to, it's called sort of sleep hygiene. And that's what um, I would discuss with um, my patients. And for those that are listening who are struggling to sleep, um, you know, some of the tips that um, um, I'd recommend are, the first one is caffeine. Um, it, it kind of might sound common sense, really. Obviously, caffeine we use to keep ourselves, people use to keep, keep awake. Um, therefore, if you're having issues with sleep, that's the first thing that that's you need to look at. To look at. Um, obviously, um, some, obviously people, some people. Um, um, is there a bit of feedback on this? Feedback on this. Sorry. Can you? Is, is there an echo? Yes, is there an echo? There is. Yeah. Yeah. There is, yeah. yeah. Um, um, sorry. We'll so sorry. Sorry. So, 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 carry on. Okay. Um, so with regards to sleep, some of the things that people can do is like said, caffeine. If you're somebody who drinks lots of coffee, you don't want to stop the caffeine straight away because you'll end up having withdrawal problems. So what happens, I'll briefly explain, is that when we wake up in the morning, we have a chemical that's um, in our body called adenosine, and that gradually builds up like a timer throughout the day. And the higher it gets, the more tired we feel. Um, caffeine re blocks adenosine hitting specific areas of the brain, which is why we then don't feel as tired. Um, so if you drink a cup of coffee at midday, it takes six hours for half of that amount of coffee or caffeine to have left the, um, the blood system. So at 6 p.m., you've still got half a cup of coffee. At midnight, you've got a quarter of a cup of coffee. So one of the things that I say to patients, if they still want to drink caffeine, coffee, tea, et cetera, do not drink it after midday because there's people who say they can drink it at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night and they can still sleep. Yes, they may sleep, but there's different um, levels of sleep and quality of sleep. So you can have your, um, your light sleep um, and then you can have a deeper sleep. And the deep sleep is the sleep that we need to regenerate. It helps with our memory, helps us feel better about ourselves so the first thing is is um cuss out or reduce caffeine um some other little tips that people can do simple ones is no exercise late at night um having a hot bath or a hot drink um, there's also things such as wearing bed socks um, and i think the science behind all of this is that when we go to sleep our body temperature naturally cools down the, the core cools down so therefore, mm -hmm. if we wear socks, it will take the blood and heat to the feet, so away from the core, 
and help to drop that body temperature by a few degrees, which will therefore help us sleep. And that's also the reason why if you try and sleep in a hot room, it's often more difficult than in a, in a cool room. So it's making sure it's not too warm um, and trying to have things that will take the temperature away to the peripheries away and so it's not in the core. Um, another tip is some people will they'll go to sleep and then the mind's racing, they can't get to sleep. There's something that I call, I talk about as the 25 minute rule, where if after 25 minutes, um, you've been unable to get to sleep, get up, go into a quiet, dimly lit room and maybe try and read a book. Um, once you start to feel tired again, then go back to sleep. The reason being is that the brain is like, it's a habitual thing in that if every time you go to bed, you're struggling to sleep, your brain then um, just thinks that bed isn't a place for sleeping. You, you, you automatically, as soon as you lie down, well, I'm not going to sleep, I'm tossing and turning. And that's also why sometimes people can fall asleep on the sofa, which they do as a habit. But then when they get up and try and go to their own bed, they struggle to sleep because the brain is programmed that for them, the sofa is where they're able to sleep and the bedroom isn't a place to sleep. So, I mean, there's some of the, the things for people to consider. Um, some, a lots of patients, you know, often ask about sleeping tablets, things like that. That's something that, you know, is a, a very, I mean, it's a, um, a last resort, I would say, because it doesn't help you sleep. It actually sedates you. So you get knocked out, but you're not actually properly getting that deep level of sleep, which is where all the benefits in terms of helping with your blood sugar, your, your, um, your, your, um, your blood pressure, all those things are dealt with um, in that deep sleep. Okay. Um, let's just change text a bit. Said, I know we've kept you uh, on the sidelines to use all these football <laughs> analogies for a while. Um, Said, uh, you, you can obviously tell us if you support a team or not, but moving on to like some chronic respiratory conditions, I know we've got a lot to get through. Obviously, you're um, interested in lung cancer and so on. And a lot of the listeners might be interested to know a bit about lung cancer, what to watch out for, um, especially in this time where you might hear in the news that uh, cancer detection is maybe uh, taking second fiddle. But can you just correct some of those misconceptions and tell some of the listeners about what they should look out for and that, uh, you know, business is open as usual? Yeah, absolutely, Fahim. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure because I think it's a very important medium of uh, communicating to the public. So one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is the fact that all the cancer referrals should actually be an urgent referral to the uh, hospitals. I think patients need to be aware of any symptoms that is slightly unusual or slightly out of context from the normal respiratory problems. Say if somebody has respiratory issues and they think there is something different or unusual, certainly they should seek some help from the primary care. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my, my uh, talk will probably be a little bit more medical as compared to Wes. Wes is a very um, football-oriented person, uh, but I, I do support City, as I said, you know, that's because one of my friends is a very staunch supporter of it. But coming back to the, the, the pandemic itself, what we've clearly seen during the COVID pandemic is people have been asked to lock down, and we've clearly seen almost about 40 to 50 percent reduction in the referrals to the prime to the secondary care with cancer related symptoms. I mean, previously, people would go with uh, symptoms of weight loss or excessive cough or coughing up blood or being breathless in the context of somebody who's got a family history or smoking history to seek some help from the doctors. Now, that's unfortunately come down quite a lot. Uh, and that worries us, and that worries me personally, because I'm quite passionate about lung cancer care, and uh, as a trust cancer lead, I look at these numbers on a regular basis. What we have, however, seen is in the last uh, couple of weeks or so, we've started seeing a little bit of a surge, or rather increase in the referrals, which is a good thing. And I think I would certainly advise anybody who has been in the lockdown and hasn't had a contact with the doctor should try and make that contact if you have symptoms that are concerning to you. Now, just on that related topic, if I may, I just want to touch upon how we've been dealing with it in the last you know, uh, couple of months, especially around this pandemic, when there's a lot of push towards uh, virtual consultations. We've done plenty of telephonic and video consultations just to try and keep our patients out in the community safe 
and we can try and deliver what we can. The famous concept of what we call as a one-stop shop clinic is going to be a big boom, I think, because that is what reduces the patient visits, but also tries to cater to their needs. So there is a lot happening in the lung cancer field, uh, especially around you know, referrals. I mean, there is a lot to talk about. I'll sure, I'm sure you'll uh, ask me something about it, but if not, I'll address it in the end as to how we've modified our, our way of working. But my message to the public is, I think you should seek help. And that's been very clearly laid out by the government to say, if you are in trouble, do get in touch with us. We are worried that there is a lot of non-COVID patients who need medical help. And in terms of respiratory, obviously, um, coronavirus is known to be mainly a respiratory sort of thing. What kind of things, side can you share with the listeners in terms of respiratory issues that you've been coming across on the day-to-day -day sort of life? Yeah. Well, at the outset, what I would probably highlight is, as of um, today morning, I would say, We've had almost close to 35,000 deaths. That just tells you the scale of the problem, the magnitude of the problem, and the severity of the problem. It's absolutely right to say this is a disease of generation. I don't think we've ever seen a pandemic like this. At least we've not seen you yeah. know, in our lifetime. So there is a significant you know, uh, respiratory element attached to it. And of course, as a respiratory physician, I would be promoting my own speciality, but I think there is, there is a significant you know, burden on the, on, on the healthcare itself from the NHS point of view, but specifically uh, respiratory medicine. And of course, um, a lot of other subspecialties are also involved in it. We have seen, you know, patients unfortunately succumbing to this illness which is quite sad and it's I think every every death is a tragedy to be honest with you mm -hmm. we've seen patients um, uh, not getting better but equally I don't want to give you a very you know doom and gloom picture because we've had quite a lot of uh, successful discharges and I was just looking at our hospital uh, you know communication that we get kind of regularly on a daily basis We've had about 400 patients, close to 400 patients of COVID who got affected, who've been discharged from the hospital. And we've had about 170 deaths. This is Lancashire Teaching Hospitals I'm talking about. So we do have you know, a significant number of discharges happening, uh, meaning patients getting better and going home. But what I can't underestimate is the mortality and the morbidity associated with it. And Wes has very nicely elicit, you know, kind of elicited the the mental health issues related to COVID. So I hope uh, that, that answers some of your, some of your question there. You've, you've obviously given a lot of food for thought. Um, and I guess from a, from a uh, health professional perspective, obviously some of the boundaries, some of the restrictions um, are starting to be lifted to some degree. Um, I'm gonna try and bring the football back into the conversation because uh, you know, I think the schedule today is quite packed. Uh, so we'd have to try and address both sides. Uh, but from, from your perspective with, you know, I think today was the first day when the Bundesliga, so the German league has, uh, has started. Um, it's really interesting how they've actually approached. I think we can certainly learn from German uh, football. Uh, I guess from a health perspective, do you, do you have concerns about this? I guess we naturally have some concern, but is it is this something that we've done too early? Um, yeah, um, and as you know, I was on BBC Radio Manchester discussing this early today as well. I feel that it is too early. Definitely at the, the lower leagues where, where Rochdale are, in terms of maybe the personnel that we have to deal with the logistics of what they're asking um, to be done. So the English Football League or the EFL have sent out a, a draft document um, a couple of days ago and they wanted players to be tested twice a week. Um, they, they could only train in small groups and then once they finished training, they had to disinfect the area and then 30 minutes later, the next batch of players would come. The things that I would be concerned as, um, as a team doctor is if somebody was to collapse in the required um, CPR, um, that's the aerosol generating procedure. So that's something that is a high risk of um, transmitting COVID to the medical professional. So myself or the physio, whoever's doing it, would the clubs have the correct PP provided? Would we be able to don it in a quick enough time to then go and help this player? So is it? it's not worth having a player 
going through a Fabrice Mwamba situation where a player may drop dead on the pitch mm-hmm. and we're not protect we're not quick enough to get our protection on or whatever and then something happens to that that person just for the sake of football um as, you know I I'm working for a service in Greater Manchester where with this covid pan, par, um, pandemic I'm verifying a lot of deaths in the community so at the moment a lot of GPs are not verifying their own patients so there's another service which I'm part of where I will go around I'm going around to numerous care homes so I'm seeing the impact of all these deaths um you know one week and I, I saw 20 people um, patients who had, who had suddenly died the, the football side of things then it puts into perspective is it really worth it do we need to go through all of this just to get the football back again when there's so many families who are losing loved ones or people are ill um so I personally um, I don't think I don't think it will go ahead anyway, um, but I personally don't think it should go ahead. Premier League, yeah, if they can logistically keep the players safe and when they go home to their families, they're not going to pick anything up. Again, I don't know how it would really work. And why uh, why should footballers be allowed to interact on a football pitch on a game day? They'd have to tackle. They're coming close to each other. Yet the government guidance is we still need to socially distance unless we're the same family. Why are they any different? And it's down to money, isn't it? Side, um, I know we're flitting between two topics, but we, we need to get back to respiratory as well. <laughs> For, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we've talked a little bit about lung cancer. That was important. Some of the other chronic conditions like asthma and COPD, let's start a little bit with asthma and what you've been seeing. There's a lot of advice there for people with asthma. Could you give some good, simple advice, maybe a uh, generic advice for the listeners out there? Sure. Uh, so as you know, asthma is dominantly younger population and COPD is probably slightly older population. Mm-hmm. So I think we, we are probably more uh, worried about our COPD patients who are out in the community uh, to be honest, most of our patients have done well in staying indoors and looking after themselves. What I would certainly suggest is, you know, um, like Wes very rightly pointed out, it's coming in contact with people and cutting down that contact is, is a paramount important thing that we've got to do. You know, we've got to ensure that we do not visit people or people don't visit their parents or their relatives if there is no pressing need for it. That's one of the biggest things that we've got to con- um, consider. Secondly, in terms of your symptoms, certainly, as I said, you know, there is a lot out there in terms of health. If you are worried in terms of your symptoms, you think your symptoms are slightly out of control, please get in touch with your primary care. Or if you're that unwell that you need to come to the hospital, please do get in touch with, you know, say, one, uh, 999 or whoever is appropriate to, to seek that help. There was one very interesting question when, of, you know, obviously there's lots of webinars and there's lots of uh, Zoom meetings going on. So one of the uh, questions was, do I continue to use my steroid inhalers during this pandemic? Mm. And I think the message is, yes, you've got to continue to use your inhalers as you've been using, uh, especially your steroid inhaler, which is your brown inhaler, usually what we call, or your uh, reliever. Um, or your preventer, sorry, your preventer uh, without fail, because I think there was a misconception at the beginning to say people may need to stop using that. So that's my kind of a, a very simple advice to the asthmatics. Of course, uh, for the COPD patients, one big piece of advice and one thing that I'm very passionate about is smoking cessation. That itself is a whole topic on its own, and I'm sure uh, we, can, we can run a session on it. But smoking cessation is very important, especially whilst we're going through this pandemic period. Apart from that, seek help. There's plenty of virtual help available. If we are worried, we will see you face to face, but with very strict precautions. Exactly like Wes said, we've got to maintain the distance. We've got to swab you before we see you face to face. There's a lot of processes being built in the hospitals and we are working kind of day in, day out to make sure when you have to visit the hospital, it is safe for you. Yeah, that, that's good. Um, Said, uh, there was a very good resource that came out of the hospital for COVID patients to support them. Uh, uh, you can maybe tell us a little bit about that, the uh, COVID patient support. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, kind of uncertainty, I think, uh, for the patient as to how we you know, going to follow them up. Um, I mean, specifically, 
from, from the cancer point of view and from respiratory point of view, um, what we have done is we have got a lot of shielding letters that have gone out to the patients. Mm -hmm. We have specifically identified some of the patients that we really want to make sure we support you, not only uh, kind of medically, but also psychologically, because we realize the COVID is not just a viral illness, but it's also got a huge uh, mental health impact on patients. So we are kind of working on those angles. Uh, what you probably also probably need to know, the public probably needs to know is there's a multi-pronged approach to this problem. We've learned so many new things during this pandemic and we've got, we've got to a stage where we've got to adapt to a new normal situation now. I don't think we'll ever go back to what we were say a year ago or a couple of years ago, even for that matter, six months ago. I think we'll have to adapt a lot of things to a new normal. So uh, by all means, I think the, the important advice is please don't ignore your symptoms. I think that's the key that I, message that I want to give to our patients and our public really. Okay. Hope that that's was great. a little serious for him. <laughs> <laughs> he's, yeah, no, he's internalizing uh, everything. He can see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was uh, that COVID patient support lthtr.nhs.uk. Um, and I know that was a very good resource that um, I've been able to use with people. And it does, it's developed by multidisciplinary health professionals at LTHTR um, and uh, was very good in giving generic advice. A lot of your colleagues, I think, side, uh, including physiotherapists, yeah. respiratory consultants, they came up with that. And it's a very easy to use resource that I'd thoroughly recommend to people. So, Mehran? Yes. <laughs> so, so and then, you know, the, the worry that I have, um, Syed, and I guess uh, Wesley can probably um, reflect on this as well. Um, has the nature of the presentation changed? Are we waiting too late? Or, um, you know, has the variability of what you see in hospital become very narrow because of the fact that uh, A, people uh, are worried about going into hospital, they're, they're worried about going into those kind of spaces um unnecessary so because i guess if there is a need you should seek help and advice um because i guess the message is quite clear but th there's still some anxiety and there's, there's a lot of unfortunate emotional dysregulation which you talked about mental health i don't know from both of your perspective whether they've um changed M maybe i can start with yourself wesley in terms of your reflections of because obviously you, you, you're doing a lot in terms of death certification um, and where you have to look at actually the diagnostic variability in terms of, diet, you know, certifying someone passing away. So from my point of view, um, as a GP there, I have noticed that a lot of people, when I speak to them, they're often saying, well, I've, I've had this for a while, but I just wanted to wait until things are settled down. So there has been some delay with, with some, some patients They naturally, oh, I don't want to bother your doctor. I know it's a busy time. Um, and there's probably people that are still doing that, which have still not called me, who could be at home having um, problems where they really need to seek medical advice. And like I said, if you have any problems that you are unsure about, get in touch, get in touch with a GP, your specialist, whoever it may be. There's no harm in asking, you know, end of the day, we're still going to work. Um, we, we're here for you. So if you have any problems, please get in touch with the surgery. Um, cancer referrals, I mean, I've still been sending people who I feel warrant what we call a two week wait. So for the listeners, you know, if you have certain symptoms, which the doctor may feel may be related to cancer, or they want to rule it out, we can refer you where you get seen by a specialist within two weeks. And that's, that's still been going on throughout the whole of this um, pandemic. So people shouldn't worry. Um, you know, those, those facilities are still there. But I, I do believe that a lot of people have been holding back um, in terms because of what they've heard in the press. Also, a lot of the elderly patients just don't want to go into the hospital, which you can understand. They don't want to put themselves in that situation. Um, but really, it's best to at least have that discussion with the doctor, explain the symptoms you have, and then you can decide amongst yourselves what may be the best approach and the safest way to do that. What are your thoughts, Dan? Well, yeah. Obviously, yeah. there's... You know, so it's a challenging environment, whichever way you look at it. Absolutely. So the way I looked at it, uh, like Wes rightly said, you know, uh, when all this started, we 
had a sudden lockdown and you know, significant reduction in the hospital admissions or rather acute um, attendances to the ED. But what that was compensated was a significant burden of COVID uh, patients or you know, patients who are really very unwell. So it kind of compensated the work significantly for the NHS. However, I think in particularly that's predominantly because of the very unwell patients and intensive care patients and ward patients who are needing a lot of help. Like Wes rightly said, you know, he's been helping out on a, on a respiratory uh, kind of a step down ward. So the amount of work I don't think has gone away. The amount of work is unfortunately sitting in the community and that is a concern for, I think, a lot of medical fraternity. Having said that, as time has progressed, we've you know, clearly we've gone over the peak and we are so slowly going through the, um, the downward slope in terms of reduction in the uh, COVID admissions and deaths, which is a good thing. But be mindful, you know, there is a very slight um, concern that whether the, we're heading towards a second wave. But I think that is a concern and only time will tell how, you know, how big an impact that will be for us. Uh, we did see some initial kind of uh, figures from from Germany and you know other European countries whether there is going to be a second surge. But I think we have to be very mindful of it. But what has happened, I think, is the the hospital attendances have crept up now, having you know having an impact on the on the bed states um, and you know people seeking help. What I would strongly recommend and like West. I think we are here for for the patients and we are here for the public and you know we we've adapted new ways and we will you know try and cope with the pressures as long as uh, we utilize the nhs in a very appropriate and a very needy basis i think that's the only way we can cope with uh, the pressures of covid and the non covid work that's out in the community so strongly encourage people to seek help if you think it's needed Thank you so much, Said. Um, I think that brings us on, along quite nicely to a, a natural break in proceedings. We're going to, and we hope to catch up again with our listeners, hopefully with some questions and some further very informative information. Thank you so much, and uh, let's catch up very soon. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, as you're away, listening to Med Talks, and you're, if you're on our YouTube channel, great. So please put some comments, and we will try to give some feedback as well uh, to those comments. So, so I guess we we have Dr. Wesley Tensel and Dr. Saeed Mehdi, who will be talking about importance of sleep, uh, reflections about COVID, uh, as well as a range of other topics. But I guess we want to try and bring the uh, focus back on to football and dementia. I'm going to start with yourselves, Wes, uh, Wesley. Uh, I guess sports injuries um, are common. Um, I'm not really too sure whether they're increasing, but clearly the, the nature and the intensity of the game uh, has changed over time. Um, there's a lot of concern, especially coming from America, about uh, concussion uh, and what to do. Um, you start to see that in rugby as well as other sports. Um, what's your understanding about... Uh, the risk related with football when it, when we think about cognitive impairment? Yeah, so there has been um, research, as you've said, done. A lot of the initial research was um, or is from America or the United States in terms of um, American football. But there's obviously quite a lot of, there's lots of impacts. And I think the evidence has shown that there's been a lot of um, neurodegenerative disorders um, associated with that. Uh, more closer to home, um, and they've done... I think Glasgow University did some research just and I think it's last year and they found that former professional footballers um, had approximately I think it's about three to four times a higher rate of death due to neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it, the, this research didn't exactly say why so it wasn't sure whether it was to do with heading the ball or was it due to collisions but it did show that there was something in that cohort of, of players those sports sports people that did increase their risks. Um, there have been documentaries about footballers with, um, you know, dementia. So there probably is some link with um, heading the ball, ball and trauma to the head. All of this, again, can link back to sleep. And as I said at the beginning, sleep, it, it, it can help everything. And um, I think one of the quotes I said before is sleep is probably the greatest legal performance enhancing drug that athletes are not using enough of. And it's not just athletes. 
we can all benefit from sleep. Um, so if I was just to take it a bit kind of away from football, but in terms of sleep and for the, for the general public, sleep, when, when we sleep, um, we, the body cleanses all the, the toxins that have been made in the brain. So in the body, we have something called the lymphatic system, which people may have heard of. But in the actual brain, we have something called the glymphatic system. And around the, the brain cells, when we go into a deep level of sleep, we wash out all the toxins from, from in the brain. And there has been um, scientific research done where they look at the sort of certain things called amyloid plaques. These are certain proteins in the brain that in people with dementia and Alzheimer's, on the MRI scans, they have a lots of these plaques within the brain. So when they've done sleep studies, they've shown that people who have been restricted from sleep didn't get that washout of the brain or that uh, like detox. And they show that they started to accumulate more of these um, protein plaques. So it suggests that over time, if you are not getting enough hours, so if you're getting six hours, four hours sleep every night, but you think you're feeling fine, you're not giving your brain that time to detox and get rid of those plaques. So sleep is very important in terms of the, um, the Alzheimer's and dementia going forward. And then with football, and again, why I preach to the footballers about the importance of sleep, not just for their performance at the moment, but for their longevity, their performance going forward, that if they're not sleeping well and they're getting, they're heading the ball recurrently or there's lots of collisions, that in combination increases their risk significantly of having some sort of neurodegenerative problem in the future. Yeah, and I guess for the listeners, um, just so that they're aware, dementia is a very broad term that's given to uh, memory problems that are quite significant, um, that's starting to have an impact on how well they can function. As you alluded to, Alzheimer's is the most common type. Probably about 60% of those uh, individuals with dementia would have Alzheimer's, and then you'll have other variations following from that. I guess my, my only worry was about these repeated concussions increases the risk of what, what we say chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So there's many different terms as given punch drunk syndrome and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but clearly, as you, as you rightly said about the study from Glasgow, it certainly uh, puts a, a focus for more research, more understanding, because mm -hmm. we're looking at a time that perhaps, you know, in terms of the lifestyle to how we are today, it may have been quite different. Um, and we know in dementia, the, the foundations have been set many decades before the onset of the illness. Um, so it's, it's certainly very interesting. Um, and I guess aside from a, from a physician perspective, you probably see a lot of, a lot of trauma, uh, a lot of episodes of delirium, because that means that the, the brain is vulnerable uh, to, some ex, uh, to some extent. Um, what are your thoughts about, um, I know that you're a Man City supporter, um, and that's, uh, you know, I'm a Liverpool supporter, so I can at least uh, smile for the time being. Whether it's just football or sports related, um, from, from a perspective of a physician, um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, clearly, I mean, uh, dementia is, as you, as you rightly said, you know, it's a, a multi-system problem. Um, and certainly from, from a physician's perspective, we, 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 we kind of... Um, uh, put dementia as one of our uh, important uh, kind of comorbidities in deciding where we go from in terms of treatments. Um, I mean, I don't know a lot about how concussions and dementia correlation, but I've, I, I certainly read that paper as well very briefly to say there is a significant uh, impact on it. But we, we have seen a lot of, you know, we have been uh, seeing a lot of patients with uh, memory issues um, on you know, general medicine and medical wards, especially coming through the front door. Very surprisingly, during the pandemic period, we haven't seen that many. Uh, whether they are being looked after you know, very well in the care homes that you know, are in their own families is probably why we don't see that very often now. But I think that was part of a, a significant part of our job you know, in terms of looking after the dementia patients. Um, I really don't want to say much in terms of how football would uh, contribute to that. I'll leave that to the expert Wes <laughs> who's there. <laughs> uh, but I think it is, a, it is a growing concern with a lot of elderly population uh, coming through. So I think that that is something that needs addressing in the longer run. There's no doubt. 
Um, we've, we've talked quite a lot about this topic, and I know time is pressing on, side. So let's go to perhaps something you're more well versed on, that's COPD, uh, and you could probably contribute uh, well on that. Obviously, COPD is a chronic inflammatory lung disease that causes obstructed flow to the lungs. Can you tell us a bit more about the condition, how it's been manifesting and in the pandemic and some tips to people who probably do suffer with it, who are in the actual audience? Yeah, let me just rewind a little bit. What I do want to say is smoking is the biggest culprit for people developing COPD. And I think that message needs to go out very clearly to the public. One biggest intervention that even as medical fraternity, we clearly say there is evidence to not having COPD is stopping smoking. So smoking cessation is the key. Common symptoms that people generally develop is breathlessness out of proportion to their normal uh, kind of day-to-day -day working, uh, wheezing, coughing, getting repeated chest infections, slightly in the older age group. Therefore, these are the things that you need to be careful. How does that fit into the COVID pandemic? Clearly, anybody who's got a chronic lung disease is at a higher risk or increased risk of having COVID or catching up coronavirus. Therefore, we have seen fair number of patients who are, uh, who've got a background history of COPD and have developed coronavirus. I don't want to dwell too much onto the medical aspects of it because what we, what we very clearly know is the patient's fitness, well, you know, we've got various terms to describe it. We've got what we call as performance status, meaning how well is the patient or how well is the you know, man or the woman who has come into the hospital into the, in their day-to-day -day life? What can they do for themselves? Can they uh, look after themselves? Can they go out shopping? Can they go out in the garden, do some work? Can they climb the stairs? All these factors play a huge role in what treatments patients get. That's one way of classing it as performance status in, PO, in COPD patients. We've got various scales as well to de define how fit patients are. But the bottom line is, again, as I said, chronic lung disease is a risk for catching up COVID. What we also know, what I just wanted to highlight is, we know uh, there's about 80% of COVID illness, which is a milder form of illness. So you mm -hmm. need to be aware of it. The fact is there's 80% of the patients could be very mild or very minimally symptomatic. And that is good news because then there is a chance, there's a very good chance that you will recover from that and you'll get better. And that is why staying indoors is the key because then you don't spread to others, but seeking help if you don't get better. It's that 20%, which is about 15% who will have fair amount of illness, what we call as moderate degree of uh, uh, illness, which needs hospital attention. Now, a lot of these 15% will have chronic lung disease and one of them is gonna be COPD. There's no doubt about it. And there's the last 5% of patients who unfortunately are ending up in intensive care and breathing machines and what we call as NIV machines or CPAP machines. I'm sure there's people out in the public who are on these tight fitting masks attached to a machine that you have it at home. Usually we use that for COPD patients, but another very closely related specialty to West, which is obstructive sleep apnea. So patients are on what we call as CPAP. So there's a significant number of patients of COPD and sleep apnea who are on these machines. And we've realized that is one of the treatments for patients with COPD in COVID crisis when they need that support for their breathing. So advice to COPD patients is, please continue to use your inhalers, your relievers, but more importantly, your brown inhaler or your combination inhalers. Please avoid smoking completely. Other important thing is antibiotics and steroids. There's a very nice system built in where if you think you need antibiotics and steroids, we should be able to dispense that for you either from the secondary care by an email to the primary care or to the pharmacist. Please use those if you think you're going through a chest infection. So that will keep you out of the hospital, but also stop you from getting really worse that you'll need to come into the hospital. So stopping smoking, looking after your inhalers, making sure you take them, and antibiotics if you need them is the way forward for COPD patients during this acute pandemic period. 
Great, Said. Um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about vaccination as well. That's obviously got an important part to play in uh, respiratory illnesses. People know, probably know about the flu vaccine, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia vaccine, and obviously one perhaps coming for this actual condition, the uh, coronavirus. Uh, take your pick, Said. <laughs> Which one do you want to talk yeah. about? <laughs> So I've got to be very careful what words I use for the vaccine for coronavirus. Um, but um, I mean, it is, it is a vaccine in the making. Okay, we, I think we certainly need one. There's no doubt we'll need one because this is a pandemic period and we need uh, people who, who don't know what a vaccine is. It's, it's basically exactly like the virus is being given to your body in a safe and minimal dose so that your body actually develops an immune response and has it in its, in its memory. So God forbid, if you do get another infection of COVID or coronavirus, similar virus infections, then your body is ready to fight that infection. But we've also, what we all need know is, it, it is a, a long haul journey developing a vaccine. It's gonna take a while. It's probably gonna take a year or maybe even eight, longer than a year. But what we also need to be very careful with vaccines is it has to be a safe vaccine. It's very, very, very minimal in you know, a side effects from it. And the, the scale of the problem is so huge. You know, we need a vaccine for, for the entire world, really. It's not localized to a country or a city. It is a huge mammoth task of developing a vaccine which is safe, effective, but also um, available for the entire world. So I think we need it. And we sh uh, there's a lot of research already happening. Um, and I thought just um, on that topic, because I've uh, put out the word research, what I also wanted to just make sure the public is aware is there's a lot of research trials going on for the coronavirus and the COVID crisis. And I would strongly encourage, I hope you don't have to come into the hospitals, but if you do come into the hospitals with COVID, please participate in research trials. We need the data. We need to know how to deal with it. It's purely voluntary but it will help a long way in understanding this problem and dealing with it in the near future. Sorry if I might have asked a question for myself and answered it myself. It's okay, that means you feel at home here and you, you feel welcome. <laughs> Wes, uh, I want to come to you as well. You're working on the COVID ward as well one day a week, aren't you? Can you maybe perhaps uh, provide some reflections or what it's like compared to your normal GP land work? Yes, so um, in Lee, they've opened a ward specifically for COVID positive patients so um, they've kind of stepped them down from Wigan so when someone has coronavirus they can still they still have the positive um, swabs yet they can still be better so they be, could be coming through the worst of it so these are sort of patients who they may have been very ill they ended up in hospital but they're starting to recover so they're, they're, they're generally fairly stable but it's a lot of the patients um, I'm looking after are those patients who would be going back to a nursing home. So the nursing homes don't want a patient who's tested positive to come back into that environment until they've been cleared for 14 days or if they have a negative swab. Um, because as we've heard, a lot of the percentage of deaths that we've had in the UK have actually been um, due to care homes. So there's nothing worse than putting a patient back into that environment, potentially spreading on the virus to others. So um, on a mo each Monday, I will, for the day, cover that ward and be on call if there's any queries um, I'll help deal with those patients but it just takes a bit of the pressure and release beds at the, the local hospitals where the patients are going in who are at their worst so it frees up the beds so those are the patients don't necessarily need to be on those acute wards there. We're, we're getting a couple of questions coming in so I'm, I'm going to open um, to both of you um, Syed and Wesley so one of the listeners have, um, have suggested that they have discovered blood clots in the lungs due to the coronavirus. Can the doctors enlighten us a bit on that? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a very, very important question, uh, Mehran. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, we know, I mean, it's a huge topic to cover, but what I would say is uh, COVID is uh, what we call as a thrombotic state, meaning people have a tendency to, to clot during this acute inflammatory condition, meaning this is such a severe infection that we have seen patients needing a lot of oxygen requirements. And one of the concerns is when people start needing oxygen is either this is an infection itself or there is clots in the lung. 
But what has been very challenging is to prove that there is a clot, you need a scan, which is again, quite a challenging thing to do during this time of you know, illness. So yes, there is more and more evidence. There's growing evidence to say the patients with COVID have higher risk of developing clots. And every hospital uh, has developed a little bit of a policy around it to see how we can tackle this to prevent people developing from clots. So uh, it's, it's a completely new thing that we've learned and it is COVID that has taught us this. I guess with re reference to blood clots, I guess if if you're diagnosed with COVID and you're quite um, you're struggling because you're on CPAP or uh, um, you know further on from that on a ventilator, for example, then you're in an immobile state, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. And naturally, you are given some degree of medication to try and thin the blood. Yeah. Is this as a consequence of despite thinning the blood, you're getting clots, or is this? Yeah. Yeah, this is despite, yeah, absolutely. This is despite uh, giving you some medications to thin your blood to prevent the clot formation, which is a standard policy, even without the COVID situations. We are, you know, we're seeing increased risk of increased clot formation in spite of people being on the blood thinning injections, which are to prevent the clots. So therefore we are having to up the doses of those, you know, uh, medications, what we call as prophylactic medications, we are having to increase the doses to prevent further clot formation. Immobility is a factor, but I think the illness itself is such an inflammatory condition that it's leading to developing clots in the lungs specifically, which is what we call as microthrombi. And there's a there's a very nice um, people who, if, if you know the list, the listener or the person who's questioned. Uh, is a medic, then what I would suggest is to read up a little bit of guidance around it on the British Thoracic Society. There's a very nice article on it. And there's a lot of uh, uh, debate about it and there's a lot of information out there. But that's purely if it is a healthcare professional. I wouldn't advise the public to read, public to read that document because there's a lot of scientific work on it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Where's uh, I gather you don't want to talk too much about these clots in the lungs, so that's fine. I <laughs> we think we've got the, we've got an expert here already. I think you know I, I couldn't <laughs> add anything more to that. I he said everything I, I would claim. Have said. I wouldn't claim to be an expert, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> more than me. Wes, well, can you give us some top three tips as we're now rapidly coming to the end of the show? Uh, what should we really remember from the things you've said and from what you've uh, been uh, reflecting back on today? Okay, my top tip, which I would say to anyone who's listening, if you to spread to your family and friends is get eight hours sleep that that will deal with everything it really will it will help everything that's going on if you can get your eight hours sleep um so that's tip number one um and related to that cut out the caffeine if you can reduce the caffeine it's it's a it's a drug um it's a drug that some people give to their children but it's still a drug we shouldn't be using that drug really and if if you can cut that out it will help with your sleep and it will help with everything else and um, I think my final tip is, in general, if you are feeling unwell in this time, in this pandemic, pick up the phone, get in touch with the GP. Um, do not think you're bothering them or they're too busy. I'm working remotely from home. If a patient gets in touch with the surgery, I will literally call them back within a very short space of time um, just to, to see their concerns. So sleep, no caffeine. If in doubt, speak to your GP. Sounds good. It's like, uh, if in doubt, hit it out, isn't it? Like a football thing, huh? Something like <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Said, um, can you give us some uh, top three tips as well, please? Okay. Can I give five each? <laughs> 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 okay. Stay at home. That's the big tip. If you know, As much as possible, stay at home. Work from home if you can. Limit your contact with people. Keep the distance safe at two meters and wash your hands regularly. That's a general tip. But some specific advice... As Wes rightly said, seek medical advice, especially if you notice unusual symptoms that you normally, even if you have medical conditions, use your NHS very appropriately. One lastly, we are here to help you and keep you safe. So just make sure you get in touch with us if you need us. Great. Mehran, any tips from you? <laughs> um, I think um, Saeed kind of touched on it a little bit. I guess the importance of research. We're obviously in a, uh, in a phase where um, you, you may have anxieties, whether you want to get involved in research. I guess the, the key thing is look at, the, uh, look at what they're suggesting, 
uh, see whether that's something that you would uh, consider and plan early. Think of, uh, you know, um, making uh, and having those kind of plans with your, with your doctor if you happen to find yourself in the hospital. So that in terms of advanced decisions about more, um, uh, um, more specifically ventilation and whether you want that degree of care. So Syed and uh, Wesley would uh, obviously know more about that, but I think it's, it's clear, take leadership in terms of your own care. And the other thing is around um, dementia. I do think there's a clear need for people of BME backgrounds to engage uh, more with uh, dementia research. Um, I do think there is a responsibility on, um, on myself and uh, clinicians and in my field to try and make it easier, make it more accessible. Um, but I think we do need to try to collaborate so that we can understand what the little nuances um, about cognitive impairment such as dementia. So I guess research, try to get yourself involved as much as you can. Excellent. Um, just left for me to thank our guests, Dr. Wesley Tensel, a Cambridge graduate, no less. We've been on our good behavior for Wes today uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule and spending it with us. And I do really genuinely hope that you stay well and you'll join us on a further occasion, Wes. Uh, with us. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's been nice to be part of the show today. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Great. And Thank also you, to Dr. Said Mehdi, um, it's been really inspirational and enlightening talking about the respiratory conditions as well. So we've really enjoyed it. And again, we'd be glad to have you again uh, on another week if you can put up with us again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that's That's great. Really. Thank you. Excellent. And obviously, a big thanks to Merhan, my co-host. Uh, we've been live on Pendle Community Radio, hours 103.1 FM, um, also on our Med Talks with an X at the end, uh, live on YouTube. And please do check out our podcasts that are on there and rapidly filling up. And please do uh, write to us. So we've got an email. We've got a website as well, medtalks.com. Uh, if you've got any questions, suggestions, and things you want for future episodes. So um, because of Eid happening next weekend, the schedule is changing and we're getting a, a regular slot. So we must have passed our probation period. I know our radio producer is listening in. <laughs> so we're back on Tuesday, 26th of May. And that's from 8 to 9 p.m. I repeat, Tuesday, 26th of May, 8 to 9 p.m. And we have Dr. Femi, who's a consultant psychiatrist, coming on along with uh, Gillian Wood, um, who's also in the fashion world and has been helping out making a lot of scrubs and gowns for NHS clinicians uh, during this pandemic. So it should be a really insightful, uh, invigorating show as usual. Many thanks again to everyone, and I hope you've enjoyed the show uh, and that we've all learned something from it. Just as a final point, as usual, we do talk about a lot of health topics, but please do seek your own GP's advice if there's any specific medical issues, and do not take this show as a substitute for seeking uh, primary care help if and when you need it. Many thanks again, and have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.